Together, let's have just a quick word of prayer, and then we'll go into our first song set for today. Ready? Our Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the holiday that we celebrate today. And Lord, for those who have been willing to give the ultimate sacrifice for us and our freedoms. May we never forget that freedom isn't free. Lord, I pray for the families who are, have buried loved ones over the years, that, Father, you would be with them today, and may their memory of their loved ones be blessed and honored. I pray today, Father, that you will bless this service, and I pray that you would use it for your glory. Speak to every heart. Lord, you know the need of every heart and every life, and I pray today that, dear Lord, you would get the glory from everything that's said and done. Have your way, and we'll be careful to thank you for all that you do. We ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you remain standing for our first song, please?
Could everyone please remain standing for the presentation of the flags and the pledges? Pledges, please, this morning. Attention, salute, we pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now to the Christian flag. Attention, salute, and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. And now to the Bible. Attention, salute, and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thank you. You can be seated. Amen. Now at this time in our service, I think Pastor Harris will be coming to do the children's part, and then we'll go further. But thank you guys for that. Amen. And thank our flag bearers this morning, and the Bible too. Let's give them a hand today. Amen. Amen. Come on, bro. Amen. Good morning. So I have to ask real quick for my kids. Are you guys excited to be done with school? That was pretty weak. weak. All right, we can send you back to school if you really want. I mean, I see one, per, one person cheering. Guys, are you excited to be out of school? Yeah, they're not awake this morning. <laughs> All right, we'll get we'll get them excited because we got a bunch of fun things coming up this summer for our kids. So just a couple of quick announcements before our kids are dismissed to Children's Church. Um, one, this Wednesday night, we're going to be starting a new series called our Summer Adventure Series. It's going to come up here on the screen. We did this last year. It was a ton of fun. So we're going to continue to be doing our Gospel Project series where our kids are going through the entire uh, story of the Bible in one year. But each week we're going to have a new and special activity for them that's going to be a fun summer adventure. This week's adventure is going to be Messy Game Night. It's the first one we did last year. We're going to do it again as all the parents sigh and all that kind of stuff. But it's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to have shaving cream, slime, chocolate sauce. It's going to be a ton of fun. But I want to encourage parents, know that this Wednesday night if you come, 
make sure your kids are not wearing their Sunday best because you won't wear it again. <laughs> so I encourage you, wear stuff. You're okay with your kids getting messy in. Wear bathing suit, whatever you're okay with them getting a little messy in because we are going to get a little messy on Wednesday night. So kids, be thinking about who you want to invite because it's going to be messy game night this Wednesday night. Also, we've got coming up, and registration is up on our website right now, we've got Vacation Bible School coming up. It's going to be July 19th to the 23rd uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 each night. It, this year, we're going to be all aboard the Rocky Railway, so it's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to be learning about God's power and God, how God's power can basically pull us through anything that we're going through. So it's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to have worship. We're going to have games. We're going to have activities. We're going to have an awesome week just worshiping God, learning about God, but also just having a ton of fun. So I want to encourage you guys, if you want to, sign up your kids. You can go to our website, cvcballground.org. You'll see it on the home page. You can register your kids there. If you would also like to volunteer to help because we're going to need as much help as we can to pull off this amazing week. If you would like to volunteer to help, you can also sign up to volunteer to help on that same registration uh, link. So just go to the website, cbcballground.org, click to register your kids and register to volunteer so that we have enough help to pull off a fantastic week. So again, that's going to be July 19th to the 23rd. So we got a bunch of other fun things planned for your kids throughout this summer, but I'm excited about the summer. The kids may not be, but I'm excited about the summer. We're going to have a ton of fun. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our series on honesty uh, in Children's Church today. Today, we're going to talk about the fact that all of us have told lies in the past. But the important thing is that when we lie, that we actually choose to confess our sins to God, that we ask for forgiveness, that we admit that we did something wrong, rather than trying to continue to lie to cover up one lie that ends up trying to cover up another lie that ends up trying to cover up another lie. The best thing that we can do is admit when we've made a mistake and to be honest and ask for God's forgiveness. So that's what we're going to be talking about in Children's Church today. We're also going to be working on our memory verse for this month. It's going to come up here on the screen. So I want all my kids, we guys practice this in Sunday school. You guys got a call, you guys got a week off last week, so I was thinking you might be a little rusty. But you guys did pretty good in Sunday school today. So I want all the kids as loud as you can. I want you to yell out this verse on three. You guys ready? I know some of you guys can be really loud, all right? Ready? One, two, three. The one who lives with integrity lives securely, but whoever perverts his ways will be found out. Proverbs 10, 9. We're going to continue to work on that in Children's Church, but I'm just excited about the summer. Be excited about what we've got planned for your kids, and especially be praying for us because we're hoping to have a fantastic, awesome summer this, uh, this year with your kids. So um, before we dismiss for Children's Church, we're going to uh, pray and just ask God's blessing on this offering. If you would like to come forward and give back a portion of what God has blessed you with, uh, we're going to have that time now. So if you would, just bow your heads, and we'll just ask God's blessing on this offering. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, God. I thank you that when we do mess up, you are always there to forgive us, God, that you love us. And God, I just pray that you help us to just now worship you with all our hearts, to remember the, the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us, Father. God, be with us offering, bless it, use it in ways we couldn't even imagine, Father, and just continue to be with this service. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you're just missing Children's Church in the back.
please join and sing with us. You can be seated. Amen. All right. So I think uh, Brother Gatewood came in. Do I see Brother George Gatewood in here? Brother Gatewood, we'd like to give you a baptismal certificate, please, sir. Good to have you here this morning. Thank you, sir. I'm going to shake your hand, too. Amen. Thank you for letting us be part of a baptism day with you. Amen. Let's give Brother Gatewood a hand. Amen. I appreciate you, brother. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. Lord mercy, what a blessing. I have one more to give out, but I think the Housers are out of town this weekend. Yeah, we'll save that one. Okay. We'll do that one next week. All right. So if you have your Bible, please turn to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. Um. I am going to be preaching through, not verse by verse in the Gospel of John. I, somebody probably ought to say amen right there. It, and the, when we did 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy's only got like four chapters and it took us five months. So if we did the Gospel of John, that would probably take like 11 years. So probably not going to spend 11 years in the Gospel of John. You could. I think that you absolutely could if you wanted to because there's just that much there. Um, I want to encourage you, if you have time, and I don't know where you are with your Bible reading, how many of you are on some kind of a Bible reading program from day to day or from week to week? How many of you do that, right? I think most everybody's got something that they do. How many have the, are uh, on a Bible reading plan that you heard from us? Like the card, remember when we print out the cards and give those out to people have those and still use those? Or how many of you have got it on an app? Anybody use it from a, an app on your phone or your computer? I encourage that, and I think it's a good idea to have a Bible reading program as you go through the, through the year. And, and the reason I do, and I'm, I'm going to get to my message here in just a minute, the reason I do is because I think it is so important that we, 
as people of God are well acquainted with the Word of God. I think that one of the, the downfalls of our modern day church, and, I, and, and us included, is I think sometimes we fall down on getting our people educated biblically or how to find things in the Bible or where things are scripturally. And I think, Lord, help us. This is one of those tools that we can use. And I'm for all the tools. I mean that. I love um, my printed Bible. I, I love this one. And this is somebody said, why do you have such a giant Bible? Is that because you're a preacher? Uh, no, it's because I need an extra large print Bible to see it. I mean, that way I don't have to stand up here and do this while I'm trying to read it to you. Who else has got a large print Bible? Let me just see if we have anybody else whose eyes are aging unfairly, right? David Jordan raised his hands immediately, right? Who else? Anybody else? Miss Sherry down here? Chris Harris? Are you kidding? Chris, you're like 12, <laughs> right? I mean, is that... Who else? Anybody else got that, Miss Deborah? Oh, we got back here. Oh, all right. I see you back there. Amen. So who in here has got a large, large print Bible? I mean, like a family Bible, you know, the... The gigantic coffee table Bible, right? I mean, um, it's a blessing to have a copy of God's Word. And I want to say to you, be a student. Be a student. Be willing to take some time and get acquainted with your scriptures. It will bear fruit in your life in ways that you have not possibly imagined. And, and God will absolutely use it to direct your path and to direct your steps as you know the scriptures. So be be acquainted with the scriptures and don't be afraid to jump into the, the, the Bible and Bible reading. And I want to encourage you, we'll be probably on uh, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, we'll probably in, be in the Gospel of John, so if you want to start reading through, you'll probably be up with me uh, in the next few weeks. Now, I'm not going verse by verse, and I'm, I may not even go chapter by chapter, but there are some high points that I want to touch on just for the next several weeks. So if you want to participate in that, I hope that you will. I want to say a quick thank you while I'm thinking about it, about the uh, Ball Ground Backpack Program. Now, a lot of you helped us with that over the year, and we had, I don't know, at the times you guys would bring in food and we would tote it back and then we would take it over to the elementary school, and it was a blessing to be a part of that program. But guys, our help with that program helped to feed, I think it's like 20 families over the weekend during the course of the school year. So I want to just give you guys a big round of applause for that. And I want to say thank you for helping. <clears throat> now here's how important that is. Okay, and I didn't, you don't add this up because we live in an, an affluent part of the country and we live in a, a, a to me, a well-to-do part of the country. But guys, there's a lot of families, a lot of school-age kids that, from the time they leave school on Monday, or excuse me, on Friday, till the time they get back on Monday, a lot of them don't have regular meals. Okay, so it, that's the, the importance of that program, is that it helps to have meals at home for the kids and a way for them to do that and to help those families. And I just want to just say thank you from my heart. I appreciate that, and it means a lot to me as a preacher that you guys would participate in that so, so generously, which you guys do. I, I need to brag on my church just a minute. Guys, I, we are careful presenting needs to you because you are such a generous bunch. I, I'm just, and I'm thankful for that. I've got a, a preacher friend or two who their churches just are not givers. They just don't do the generosity things and they have a hard time generating any traction towards that, but that's not the case here. You guys always excel, always excel. And I, I love and appreciate you guys for that. Thank you for that. All right, John chapter 1. <clears throat> John chapter 1. I am not going to preach on every one of these verses. I want to just give you a couple of the uh, introduction to the book here in just a second. But we want to read the verses. I'm going to read down through verse 18. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now the John that he's referring to here is not John the Baptist, or excuse me, John the Beloved. This witness here in John... 1 and 6 is John the Baptist. I said it backwards, but it's John the Baptist that he's talking about here. The same, verse 7, came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. 
Now, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Let's pray and then we'll get into our scripture today. Father, we tread holy ground here this morning in these scriptures. And Lord, I pray today that you would remind us of the joyous event that's given to us here in the, book, the gospel of John. I pray that you would illuminate our minds and our hearts today. I pray, Father, today that you would use these scriptures to speak peace, that you would use this teaching to speak hope, and Lord, that you would draw all men to yourself like you said you would if we would lift you up. And I pray today, Lord, above all else, may we lift up Jesus Christ. I pray today that, Father, you would be glorified in everything that's said and done. Lord, in our church family today, there are a lot, a lot of prayer requests. I pray today that, Lord, you would answer each one of those according to your will. And we'll be careful to thank you for all you do. We ask these things today in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> Several writers have tried to sum up their feelings about the Gospel of John. And they're ancient writers. Some of them are contemporaries. They're, they're my age or older, if that tells you anything about how old they are. I am careful about some of the newer theology books or some of the newer commentary sets because they have some content, but they don't have the depth of the old writers. And I'm, I'm confessing that for myself. I love the old writers. I've got a, just some uh, amazing sets of books. And then on my, my study program that I use, there's even more sets of books in there than I have time to look at. I, I'm, I enjoy trying. I really do. But I, I could... Honestly, get lost in that. Just and Miss Terry can testify to that. She will uh, come hunting me or calling for me, and I'll be upstairs a little bit deeper in the Gospel of John. And but some of those writers said that they believe the Gospel of John is very probably the greatest book that's ever been written. That the Gospel of John is one of the capstones of the entire Bible, and I have to agree with that. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. When you take the four Gospels, if you look at the Gospel of Matthew, you'll find Jesus Christ identified by his genealogy from the line of David to identify him to the Jewish people as their king. And he writes a kingly gospel, and he talks about the kingdom an awful lot in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew addresses that so that the Jewish people would see and know Jesus for who he is. And they, it was written from that standpoint strictly just about to them. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest. I think there's only like, is it 16 chapters in Mark? I mean, somebody, is that right? Somebody shaking their head. Miss Stephanie said, yep. So there's only like 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark. There are no genealogies in the Gospel of Mark because they present Jesus in the Gospel of Mark as a servant. And who gives a genealogy for a servant? we not so much worried about his genealogy as we are worried about what he can do. So he is presented there as the one who serves. And so it's concise, it's, well, it's wonderful, well-written, but it's a shorter uh, a set of stories and a set of the recollections about Jesus. And it's written by, now the Gospel of Mark is actually written by John Mark, who Paul, remember Paul had a falling out with him and they sent him home. It was unprofitable, but later on, 
he wrote uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, okay? And so you have a pretty wonderful story from that. I'm not going to preach on that this morning. The book of Luke was written by the doctor, the, the beloved physician Luke, and Luke write his, writes his story just about to the Gentiles. I mean, it is written in really precise Greek language. It's really precise stories It's the that they, they might confirm everything factually. I mean, and he was a, a really good, and I love that he wrote not just the Gospel of Luke, but that he also wrote the Gospel or the book of Acts, okay, so that the early record of the church is there. And thank God for the writings. Amen. I mean, hallelujah, we have a record, right? And then you have the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John is unique because there are several things that are in the Gospel of John that are not in the other writings, okay? The other writings primarily talk about the events that happened around Jesus and the things that he taught and the things that he did and the things that he said, and so they are more concerned with recording the event, okay? But in the Gospel of John, he explains why. He goes into not just the event, but what the events mean, okay? So it's a little bit closer there's an awful lot of heart in the Gospel of John, always. In the Gospel of John and in the writings of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, you'll find love for God and how much He loved us and how much we all love each other is all the way through His writings. It permeates everything that John talks about is love. Now, I want to say this to us. So John is different in that John didn't just write to the Jews, okay, and John didn't just write to the Gentiles, okay. John presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God, for the entire world. And we studied this a week or two ago in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world. Right? I mean, Nicodemus was sitting there. Nicodemus was, of course, a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a man who had been in and around the, the, the Jewish temple or the Jewish synagogues his entire life, was an expert in the law. And when Jesus came, he came seeking. He came asking, who are you? I mean, nobody can do what you do except God be with him. I mean, you remember the story, and I'm not going to re-preach all of it, but Nicodemus was thinking about it from strictly a Jewish perspective or simply a Jewish outcome. They were looking for somebody to overthrow the Romans. They were looking for somebody to get them out of the trouble they were in. So Jesus had to straighten that out. And here's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, listen, uh, for God so loved who? Not just the Jews, the world. Okay, I mean, so you see in the Gospel of John, we, we have this writing. So the introduction to the Gospel of John, and I will we'll do some more work on this as we go, all right? But look at verse 1 here for just a minute, and I want to talk about this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So now let me give you a hint about something here, okay? This is a very familiar sound because it also rings out of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the book of origins, right? I mean, Genesis literally means beginnings, all right? So back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? I mean, so we have a direct connection between here and there, all right? And I'm not going to have time to preach on all that today. I just want to make sure you can connect the dots. For the crowd saying we don't need the Old Testament you're going to be in trouble as we go through the Gospel of John because there's an awful lot of references to the Old Testament writings and the things that Jesus did and the prophecies that were fulfilled around him lets us know and reminds us that we need the complete canon of the Word of God. Would somebody say amen right there? You need all of the scriptures if you're going to be a balanced Christian, not just your favorites, not just the part that you enjoy reading the most. You need to read those parts that absolutely get on your toes. Or sometimes get on our heart, amen, or sometimes, and all those unpronounceable names, and when we get to heaven, I want to talk to somebody's parents and say, why in the world would you name your child an unpronounceable name? I'm glad we don't do that around here. I am. I am real tickled we don't do that around here. We've got a young fellow running around, and I finally met him. His name is Milo. Now, I don't know who Milo belongs to, but I do know well, I do know who Milo belongs to. He's right, our mama's right back there, right? But I went and met him. I said, we have a Milo. I'm going to go see who that is. But I love that. That's four letters. I can spell Milo. That's why they picked it for him, because it wouldn't be hard spelling, right? I mean, and then, but, I, but those unpronounceable names, you even need to read them, and here's why, okay? As you get into your study time, you will see those names in other chapters, okay? As you go through your Bible, trust me, they will be in other places, so take some time. I'm, I'm not 
Now, we used to have a, a Bible teacher here years ago, Brother Hugh Reynolds. Brother Hugh has gone home to be with the Lord now, but Brother Hugh could take those, that, those list of names. And Did anybody here ever get to go through one of Brother Hugh's classes? Would you raise your hand if you did that, right? Wasn't he amazing at that? But he would just take, I don't know, how, and he would say, I need to bring you a question. I'd be like, no, no, just ask the Lord. I, <laughs> I, if you don't know, I promise I don't know. I mean, but that was him. He loved that stuff, and he would teach on that, and he would work his way through those names, and when he got done, you could make sense out of them because they, you start connecting the dots, okay? Now, I've got to tell you something that's the truth about God's Word, all right? It's not a disconnected bunch of stories. It's not a disconnected bunch of books, okay? The Bible absolutely has a central theme. The Bible absolutely has a central character that comes through all the way through every book in the Bible. God's purpose is always fulfilled coming through the Scriptures, all right? God has not left us without a witness. Hallelujah, God has not left us without a witness. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So you've got the beginning, and, and the, the, we need to know what the Genesis story is because it gives us the story of our creation. We know how the world came to be, okay? I believe that in the beginning God created, and I believe the creation story just like it's reported in the Scriptures. I believe the creation of man happened just like the Bible says it. I don't think we evolved out of something else into something else. But somebody help me right there. Now, for you evolutionists, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I just want to give you a quick experiment if you would like to verify the theory of evolution. Okay? So, suppose, does anybody have a really nice watch in here? I don't, I have, this is not a watch, this is a Fitbit. All right? But suppose, now don't bring me a nice watch, but let's suppose that somebody in here had a Rolex. All right, now, for those of you who don't know a Rolex, you cannot buy those. You shouldn't be able to find that at Walmart. If you do find a Rolex at Walmart, it's probably not real. Right? Let me help you. All right, or at the flea market. If you're at the Jasper flea market and they have a Rolex, it might not be authentic. I'm just saying, right? I mean, so if you don't spend a bunch of money. All right, but if you did have an authentic one that was worth 50, 60 grand, okay, well, a really good one, Suppose you brought it up here to me and you and I took a little set of screwdrivers and took that thing all the way apart. The whole thing, all them little dials, all, everything, all the numbers, everything out of it that was in there, every bit of it, okay? And we just took the whole thing apart, deconstructed every bit of it. And I would, Brother Gatewood's an educated guy, I would get him to help me. And we would take that thing apart piece by piece by piece. Now, how many pieces do you think would be in there? Anybody got a guess? I don't know off the top of my head. Does anybody know? Wouldn't it be hundreds? Right? I mean, wouldn't it just be, right? I mean, there'd be all kind of little springs and dials and hands and little click things and all those other things. And little, all, let's take the band apart, too. All right? So we take it all apart, and we just put it in a box, and we just start shaking the box. Okay? Now, you know why we're shaking the box? Because if we believe evolution really is true, we think that if we shake that box enough times, at some point in time, we'll have a working Rolex watch again. That's what evolutionists believe. They think that out of the random chaos of the Big Bang or the explosion, can I tell you something? The Big Bang did happen. In the beginning, God said, let there be, and bang, there it is. All right? Who? Now, somebody's checking your head going, Brother Jeff, that ain't even scientific. In the first place, nobody's going to bring you the watch. And we don't even have a box. I mean, preacher, I mean, that's dumb. Nobody, nobody's going to do that. But now, hear me with this. Okay, it's just easier to believe in the beginning God than it is to come up with some other theory that explains God away, that explains creation away, and explains us away. Guys, we didn't evolve from monkeys. We came from, we were created in the likeness and image of God. And as such, we ought to live like that. As such, we ought to, we ought to be his image bearers. Somebody said, preacher, why are they trying to degrade us as image bearers? And here it is. They don't want us to live like we belong to God. They don't want us to reflect Him. They need us to descend further into chaos and further into turmoil and everything else. And God's plan is the other way. Jesus came to reverse that. 
Now, what happened in creation, in the beginning, God created. And after every day, and God saw that that was good. And God saw that that was good. And God, and God created man. And God saw that that was good. It was not good for man to dwell alone. And you know the rest of that story. But guys, in the story of creation, we know where we came from. In the story of creation, we know where the world came from. In the story of creation, we know with certainty that God made everything with a design, with a purpose in mind. Now, I can demonstrate this to you, and I don't mean to preach all day on this, but you need to hear this. Guys, if the earth was tilted just a little bit more on its axis, nothing would stick to it. If the gravity was just a little bit different on the planet, the tides would overflow everything on the planet every day. If the moon was a little further in or a little further back, you, you, again, you got all kind of a mess. If the oxygen content on this planet was just a little bit different, it would not sustain life. If the sun was a little bit closer, it would be too hot. Now, somebody said, wow, isn't that an amazing set of coincidence that all those things just happen to be? Um, can I help you, dude? You, you're probably crippled too high for crutches. That ain't coincidence. That's God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God said, let there be. In the beginning, God made. And we, as human beings, we are not just a higher classification of animals. Guys, we're created in the likeness and image of God. That matters that we know that. That matters that we understand that. And that's why John doesn't just start with a human genealogy here. John starts with, in the beginning was the Word. God is, John is connecting the dots between here and there. And John is saying the origin matters. Hey, creation matters. Where we started matters. What God's plan was from the beginning matters. Because when, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it didn't take God by surprise. God didn't look at that and go, oh my gosh, I wasn't thinking they were going to do that. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus Christ stood as a lamb slain before, before, before the foundation of the world. Before God ever said, let there be anything, in his mind, Calvary had already happened. Before Adam and Eve were ever created, God knew that it would take a redeemer to right man with himself. And God started his plan of redemption in eternity past. Man's sin did not set God's plan in motion. Man's sin does not derail God's plan in motion to this day. That's why I preach to you guys, Jesus. Listen, the world has gone crazy. There's some things that are off their rocker. Would somebody say amen right there? There's some things that are happening in society that when I look at it and I go, holy cow, whoo, how did we get over there? And, but you know what? Not one thing, not one thing ever has taken our God by surprise. Not one thing ever has, has, has happened where he said, man, they a lot dumber than I thought they were going to be. Or hey, oh gosh, they're a whole lot further out of bounds than I thought they were going to be. Can I help you with something? When God made you, when God created you, he took into account your stupidity when he created you mine too somebody said that to me one day and made me mad and I said what stupidity <laughs> and my wife said you know <laughs> now I stay with me somewhere here because this this goes somewhere okay when we look at this in the beginning guys you are not a random accident your parents may not have been planning on you, but God did. Come on. You're not just some kind of random cosmic something other. Listen, God had a plan and a purpose in your life or you'd not be here. Listen, God had a plan and a purpose for your life. And, and you got to hear this. God gave Jesus to redeem you. You're not just some kind of accidental something that happened, and you're not just a blot somewhere on something. No, no. Listen, God said, live, and you are here. The great creator said, I, I love you, and I'm going to give my son for you. You matter. You're important. You matter. You matter to God. Now, you, your friends or your family may not see and know that, but I'm going to tell you something today, and you, I hope you hear my heart with this. The God of heaven, the great God of creation, Loves you enough to give his only son for you. Hallelujah. He still saves. Now, look at this. So we have the connection with the beginning. So we have the word. If only we could identify who that word is. Hmm. I had a fellow one time arguing me about that. And he said, we don't know who that word is. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. So all things were made by him. and Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Look at verse 5. 
Light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. So the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Well, can I preach on this a minute? I'm going to go over a minute or two today. Is that all right? Ready? Your Bible may say it was a young woman, but my Bible says he's born of a virgin, just like the Scripture said he would be. Guys, there's a brand of theology running around today that says that Jesus was probably born of an illegitimate union between Mary and some kind of soldier that had a citadel somewhere there close by. I would like to preach on that just a minute because I think that needs skinning. Guys, that's a heresy. There are no worse heresies than the ones that attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are no worse heresies than the ones that attack the deity of Christ. Satan has from the beginning tried to pollute the seed of the woman. Has done his best to pollute that to the point to where God couldn't use it. Has tried to pollute that, pollute that to the point to where it would be meaningless when it came time for Jesus to come. And he has failed at every attempt because I'm here to tell you today. Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost in the virgin womb of the Virgin Mary. Amen. Just like the Bible said he would be. He was born at Bethlehem just like the Bible said he would be. He was born at the tower of the flock just like the Bible said he would be. Guys, the birth of Jesus Christ was exactly on God's timetable. Happened exactly in time, just like God meant for it to be. Happened exactly at the place that God would have it be. Somebody said, wasn't that an amazing coincidence that one of the Caesars said, hey, you know what, we're going to tax everybody, and that put uh, Joseph and Mary in motion to go back to his hometown at the point of time when Jesus was about to be born. And oh, what a wild coincidence. He just happened to be born at the exact place, at the exact moment, in the exact way the Bible said he would be. <laughs> Come on. Guys, Lord of mercy. Look at the next part of this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry up here. I'm gonna, I'll wind up preaching all evening. So in him was life. Now, you've got to have this. In him is still life. Dear friend, if your pursuit or your thinking that you're going to find life outside of a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if somehow or other you think, if I have enough money, I won't need Jesus, if you have somehow or another thinking, you know what, if I can be popular enough, I won't need Jesus. Or if you're thinking, you know what, if I can do a good enough deeds, if I can do enough things, I won't need Jesus. I want to tell you something today, and you need to hear my heart. The Bible absolutely says, in him is life. Seek life elsewhere, and you are going to be disappointed. Seek life in another way, and you are absolutely going to come up dry. Seek life through the law. The Jews did that, and look where it got them. Amen. The law could never redeem. According to Paul in Romans chapter 4 or Romans chapter 8, the law, all the law could do was to make us guilty. The law was never given to make man righteous. The, the law was given to show us the righteousness of God. The keeping of the law will not redeem a single person. If it could, why would Jesus come? Somebody said, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to be good enough. I won't need Jesus. Listen. Thank God God has helped you because you need it really bad. You need to hear this message today. Thank God Jesus came and you can know him. Thank God Jesus came and you can have relationship with him. Hallelujah, Jesus came and he was born in a manger. Why? Because everybody can approach a manger. He, didn't, he was not born in a high palace somewhere. Nobody would have had access. But in the manger, the shepherds came. The, the angels were out in the field by night. When Jesus went up to the temple like he was supposed to, according to the scriptures, he went up there and Simeon had access to him. Anna had access to him. Hallelujah, Jesus came to where the common person might, might, might have access to him. All the way through the four gospels, you'll find Jesus making sure the common person has a voice with him. And man, I, and, and I want to tell you something, and I love this about him, and I love this about the story. When Jesus went somewhere, and the, the publicans, the Bible says, then, and I believe it's Luke 15, 1, then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. 
That enraged those Pharisees and those scribes and those synagogues because none of the sinners or the publicans went to, and by the way, the publicans were IRS people. So if you are here and you are an IRS worker today, don't raise your hand. I have good news for you. God loves you guys too. The publicans and the sinners drew near to hear Jesus preach. They, and, he didn't, he didn't, and he didn't soft soap his message. He preached to them. Listen, he preached truth to them too. And when he corrected them, he said, go sin no more. I mean, he, he didn't take the edge off of that. But I'm going to tell you something today. The hardest preaching, the hardest messages that Jesus brought was not to sinners. Okay, It was to those who consider themselves righteous. It wasn't to the unrighteous that he preached the hardest. It was the self-righteous he preached the hardest. That's who he preached his hardest messages to. And man, <laughs> he set their hair on fire every time. He preached a message and he did a work on the, on the Sabbath day. He went in there and there was a guy sitting there with a withered hand, I think it was, and he healed him on the Sabbath day. I think Jesus, when we get to heaven, I promise you he's got a wonderful sense of humor because he always did that. On the Sabbath day, he would, he would get in the Sabbath day and do something in their synagogue just to watch their heads pop. I mean, I, <laughs> I love that about him. I'm going to tell him when I see him, Lord, I, do, I love because I, I, I hope I would have enough nerve to do that too. I mean, just go around with the, you know, just saying, here, let me light that for you. <laughs> but he would do stuff on the Sabbath day just to watch them go through their gyrations to the point to where they tried to kill him several times. They were going to stone him. Or they were going to take him out to the one place and throw him down that, remember that, the hill of precipice we went to there? Was it um, outside Nazareth, wherever that was? It was a really sharp hill, steep hill there. They took him up there and they were going to chunk him down. And you know why? Because they healed somebody on the Sabbath day. And then told them, listen, y'all are hypocrites. You lead an ox or a donkey to a watering trough on the, on the Sabbath day, but I can't heal a person and make them whole. Or that, how about that guy that had been on the bed for how many years? And Jesus healed him on the Sabbath day, and, they, and the Jews called him, and they said, hey, against the law, you're not supposed to be toting your bed on the Sabbath day. <laughs> I think they missed the point. Don't you? I think they missed the point. Listen, they, and there was a guy that they all knew was a cripple and had been a cripple his whole life, and five minutes in front of Jesus, and he was never the same again. Hallelujah for what Jesus Christ can do. Listen, you don't want to take the Bible away from him, and you don't want to get him away from who the Scriptures say he is. In him was life. In him was the true light. And I'm not going to preach on all this today. I'm just trying to get my introduction for the rest of it. He has come. He has come. Jesus Christ is the only person to ever pre-exist his birth. You didn't misunderstand me. He did not become the son of God when he was born of a virgin. He was the son of God in eternity past. The Trinity did not come into existence when Jesus stepped into creation. The Trinity, the Bible tells us that they had fellowship and communion with one another before there was a creation. There's never been a time when they did not exist. God the Father has always been. God the Son has always been. God the Holy Spirit has always been. He has come. The shepherds by night the angelic host, the witnesses who came. He has come. Now, friend, I want to ask you a question. What do you believe about Jesus? There are people, and, and I'm not mad, I, and I'm not, I, and who have sincere questions, and, and I say, ask the sincere question. I mean that. Listen, Jesus never did run off people who had sincere questions. He sat down to talk with those people. The people who were just being difficult, though, he didn't put up with them either. He put them in the road pretty fast. You know why? Because he came to seek and save that which is lost, not to reconfirm a bunch of self-righteous people who can only see fault in everybody else. What do you think about Jesus? Do you stop where the world stops? Great teacher, amazing orator, did some miracles. Do you stop there or do you go a little further and say, you know what? No. You know who Jesus is? He's God's son. 
He's the way of salvation. Over here in just another chapter or two, there's a disciple named Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, they come and get, tell him, they say, listen, we found the Messiah. It's him. And he's in, over from Galilee. And Nathaniel stops him and says, can any good thing come out of Galilee? And they said, come and see. I think John 142 or something like that. He said, come and see. So they take him to Jesus. And so Jesus is sitting there and Jesus tells him what he said to that other disciple. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And, and Jesus said, okay, you believe because I said I saw you under the fig tree. But you know what? You are going to see greater things than that. Because from henceforth, you're going to see the son of the heavens open and the son of man and the, the, he, the angels ascending and descending. Um, and, and Nathaniel was a believer. He became a follower of Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus was doing though? Does anybody remember the dream of Jacob? When he left home. And he went to that first place that night. And he woke up. And there was the. Was it at Bethel? Or was, uh, I believe it was the place called Bethel. But he camped there that first night. And he used the pillows of that place. Or the stones of that place for pillows. And he was sleeping. And he woke up and behold it was a dream. And there was a ladder. From earth to heaven. Right? Remember? You know what Jesus was telling Nathaniel? I'm that ladder. I'm the connection between heaven and earth. I have stepped out of eternity into time. I've stepped out of the glory of the throne room into the dinginess of this old world. Guys, that's holier ground than I know how to preach on. He has come, and he calls to you. He has come, and he seeks you. Would you bow your heads, please? I'm through preaching. They're going to come and just play a verse or two of a song, but I want to ask you a couple of questions. Do you know our Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? Oh, you can he came to redeem. He came to seek and save. He came to forgive. He's made a way for you to know him. They're going to play a verse or two of a song and our altar is open at this time. You would say, preacher, I just want to come thank God for his goodness. I want to come and thank God for the mercy that he has given. Or maybe you've got a prayer request that you'd like to share. Why don't you come at this time, and we'll meet you at, here at the front if you'd like to pray. Come right now while we wait for you. Amen. Would you like to come and pray? Come right now.